This is our kickoff. And our goals of, for the next 24 hours are really to form teams and to start thinking about um, uh, social, uh, about, the, about poverty alleviation. And we're gonna, we have a two problem framing. So that's a very broad topic. So we have two problem framings that you can look at and we'll be sharing those after the, after the talks. But um, the talks that you'll hear, um, that everyone is hearing at the same time, are meant to kind of frame and uh, kind of frame the journey. You know, uh, you'll, you'll hear from Julianne. She's been looking at systems thinking in, in a very deep way around poverty alleviation. And you can, we can almost like jump into her mindset, how she's had to think as, as poverty is not being just a singular thing that you're solving, but that it's really part of um, a broader system. We're gonna hear from Mike Seizu and Mike has, um, I worn, you know, the, the same hats that you'll be wearing now is as a social entrepreneur and under some really challenging circumstances, he's found a way to keep persevering and continue building a business that is also creating social impact. And then tomorrow we'll hear from Daniel um, Jean Louis, uh, and he is, you know, he has written a book from aid to trade and he's been in the mindset of how do I make, how do I create social impact? He's been in the entrepreneur setting, and then now he's on the investor kind of mindset. So he can take us through that journey as well as we are right now thinking about being problem solvers, but I hope that each of you one day is, sees yourself as an investor and you can invest and support other people and their ideas as they grow. Um, so we will jump into our talks. I know that you might have questions at this point, and I know that um, you probably also are excited to meet each other. There is time for all of that, so so don't worry. We we have built in time into today's session to do some speed networking as well. So you'll get to meet um, people that are that may or may not be on your team, but just that are part of this event and from all over the world. And um, there will be time for Q and A as well. So um, I'm going to um, check in with Julie and see if she is ready for um, for her talk, or if we maybe we'll take a we can take a little break if she wants us a moment. Sure, I'm here. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and get my screen a uh, screen shared. There we go. Um, I hope everyone is doing well uh, this morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. Um, as Mital said, my name is Julianne Saver Casenza, and I'm one of the co-founders and the executive director of the African Education Program. Um, I'm really just so grateful and excited to be a part of this Impactathon, and I just can't wait to see the innovation and creativity that's going to be generated and the social enterprise ideas that'll be created over the next 24 hours. Um, I've had the privilege of being a part of initiatives aimed at creating solutions to eradicate poverty for nearly 15 years. Uh, the vast majority of my work has been with the African Education Program, a nonprofit organization with the aim of empowering the youth of Zambia through education and leadership development to break the cycle of poverty in their communities. I also spent several years at a cause-driven communications firm with a mission to help extraordinary people to tell their stories for the good of the world. And this Impactathon has brought together hundreds of change makers from around the world. And despite our different nationalities, ethnicities, religions, and educations, our common thread is that we're each eager to create sustainable solutions to end poverty. Another common thread is that no matter whether we seek to approach poverty at a community, national, regional, or global level, poverty is systemic. It's rooted in economics, politics, and discrimination. And the different root causes may vary for each context, but poverty is still systemic. Um, too often, when we talk about poverty, we describe it as the current experience that a person faces we describe it as a state of being, right? Um, so for example, poverty is a family making less than $2 a day, or poverty is a single mom who cannot afford food or shelter for her children. Poverty is a girl living in a rural village who cannot go to school. But poverty is so much more than just an experience or a state of being. 
poverty is the result of many systemic root causes. And these root causes may have begun hundreds of years before a person today experiencing poverty was even born. Um, and, these, and there's new root causes that might be digging in as we speak. And these root causes have grown into a system of laws and policies and practices, and the system exploits the poor and excludes them from the economic and social opportunities, which would allow them to no longer live in poverty. So what, here, let's take a look at some examples of, of root causes of systemic poverty. One example is post-colonial plunder. So despite having gained independence even decades ago, many countries have their natural resources being hoarded by a few. Only a small fraction of the wealth generated from these resources ripples through the economy, preventing the financial returns generated by these resources from actually being able to be fully absorbed. Foreign ownership of mines in Africa is an example of this. We also have post-racial, I'm sorry, post-slavery racial wealth gaps. Um, in the United States specifically today, uh, the typical black family has just one-tenth the wealth of a typical white one. This inequity stems from generations and generations of institutional discrimination. We have social marginalization, and this is around the world, where groups of people along ethnic or racial lines are excluded from representation and decision-making power, and they're discriminated against and exploited and left with little access to the resources they need to provide productive lives. Discrimination, underrepresentation, forced assimilation, and land grabbing from indigenous groups in the Amazon is an example. Gender inequality, again, worldwide. Women and girls are not equal to their male counterparts. In 2019, the World Bank found that women only had equal rights to men in six countries, six in the whole world. Everywhere else, gender inequality is being enabled by legal discrimination, harmful beliefs, lack of access to sexual and reproductive health care, and low levels of political participation conflict and war and violence, just the insecurities created by conflict perpetuate poverty. From economies coming to a halt to shifts in power dynamics, conflict fuels poverty. So take for example in Syria, before the current conflict began, 20% of the population was poor. Today only 20% are living above the poverty line. We have poor infrastructure, a lack of access to health services, clean water and sanitation, and quality education go hand in hand with poverty. So without these essential infrastructures, too many people continue to live unhealthy lives. Food inequity, while some countries don't have enough investment in agriculture and irrigation, other countries are just inexplicable, oh, I'm sorry, we can't explain the amounts of food that we're wasting there. So, and, and one thing that we cannot ignore is that any of the root causes of systemic poverty are being compounded by climate change. And I know that's gonna be an important theme, you know, over the next 24 hours as we're looking at these social enterprise ideas. So there's good news, you know, this feels like a lot of bad news, but there is good news because when we begin to start to think about poverty through a systemic lens, we can achieve so much more in the fight to break the cycle. So instead of putting our energy and our, our resources into band-aid, short-term, quick fixes that alleviate the symptoms of poverty, we start with the vision to create systemic change of the root causes. We move beyond temporarily alleviating the immediate needs of a poor family by providing, for, for instance, food or clothing or shelter, and instead we strive to open the doors so that the family can identify the root cause of their poverty and change the structures that are keeping them there. So I'm going to take a breath here. I hope everything's going okay on a, on a technological side. I uh, just want to do a quick check in there. Are we good? Everyone's here? Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All righty. Let's keep, let's keep on going. Um, so when you're starting a new initiative, like a new social enterprise, right, as we're approaching this for the next 24 hours, I believe that there's five really important questions to ask and explore. Those are, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? Why does this problem exist? How does my solution solve one or many of the root causes of the problem? How can my solution be sustainable and create sustainable change? 
And why do I want to be a part of the solution? So when answering these questions, I encourage you to map out the issues um, you're exploring by using a problem tree. And I know these are in, I think, folders that everyone has access to. Um, and this is just a really great exercise to get going. Um, so while the African Education Program is a nonprofit organization and not a social enterprise, it can still be used as an example to walk through the five questions. So our first question, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? In our case, the problem that we're trying to solve is that the youth of Zambia are the ones who are best positioned to be catalysts to create change and break the cycle of poverty in their communities, but they rarely have access to the resources and opportunities that they need to be inspired and empowered leaders. Some of the effects or the symptoms of this problem are that 60% of Zambians live below the poverty line. 30% of girls become pregnant before the age of 18. 95% of Zambian students do not reach international proficiency levels in reading and mathematics. So you can see those are the effects. But where we often fall short is we don't start to look at the root causes, right? We'll come up with a solution just trying to do a quick fix on the effects instead of actually looking at why does this problem exist. So in our case, I would identify some of our root causes of this problem as underqualified and unmotivated teachers using an outdated education curriculum. You're looking at an economy with limited diversity and opportunity for financial prosperity. You have a post-colonial mindset that's coupled with a social and religious norms that suppress individuality, questioning, and innovation. As the rest of the world, we have gender inequality and we have marginalization of um, groups, specifically persons with special needs in this case. And you have lack of food security. And I wanna take a, a pause here because I think what's super important at this point, when you've started to outline your root causes, push yourself and ask, what is it about this problem that I don't understand, right? It's easy to identify the ones you do, but keep pushing yourself to explore what is it about this problem that I don't understand? And then start to look at how does my solution solve one or many of the root causes of the problem? So when speaking about the African Education Program solution, um, it'd be unfair to not be fully transparent with all of you. We've grown slowly and, orga and organically over the past 15 years. And we did not start with this type of systemic approach. We grew into a systemic approach because we were always working hand in hand with the community and our youth beneficiaries. And very honestly, you know, our solution started with an approach that addressed the symptoms of poverty. And it's only in recent years that we've grown into seeking to tackle the root causes. We started as an after school youth center so that students could have a safe space after school a scholarship program so that children from poor families could continue to have access to school. And we provided a daily meal to temporarily alleviate hunger. Um, so today we're taking a much more systemic approach. Um, let's look at the root cause of outdated education um, curriculum and underqualified and unmotivated teachers. So despite these realities that exist in Zambian schools, we do still have our scholarship program because we do believe in the social benefits gained from attending school, even when the quality is low. An example of this is that girls are less likely to become pregnant, for example, with each year that they stay in school. <clears throat> but at the same time, now we've begun to work to advocate for educational change at a national level, and we're creating opportunities for the youth to develop their advocacy skills to join the movement. And so that the youth, that the current youth, you know, are not left out while we're striving for systemic educational change, we're enhancing the educational quality that they have access to by providing quality tutoring after school and learning opportunities like field trips. Let's look at the root cause of the economy, right? And it's limited diversity and opportunity for financial prosperity. We're actually piloting our financial literacy and entrepreneurship program, which seeks to provide the knowledge and resources that youth need to start a small business or entrepreneurial venture to ensure that they have the skills and resources to lift themselves out of poverty. This is how I got to know Join the Journey. 
And when you consider the root cause of post-colonial mindset, what we've done is, and, and uh, again, this is coupled with social and religious norms that are suppressing individuality, questioning and innovation. What we're doing is we're, we're weaving leadership development and volunteerism into all of our programs. And we're also working hard to create a culture of dreaming, creativity, innovation, and belief in each and every person's individual power. And we work to make sure that the youth have the self-esteem and belief they need to know that they can make a change. So with regard to gender inequality, from the beginning, we've always had a great concern for promoting opportunities for Zambian women and girls and ensuring that they're equal participants in the planning, operation, and benefits of our programming. A key goal has been to build the leadership of our female staff and students and empowering them to be strong, vocal woman, women who will break the mold in a society that demands their submission. At the same time, we have a very strong focus on empowering our young men through programs focused on equality between women and men as partners, reproductive and health rights, elimination of gender discrimination and violence. And we're really proud to maintain a 50-50 ratio of male to female youth in our program. To address the marginalization of persons with special needs, we're creating opportunities for boys and girls with special needs to learn the life skills that they need to live fulfilled lives and also advocate for the changes needed in society so that they have equal access to education and equal access to economic empowerment. And as I mentioned before, you know, this whole time we've been using a short term fix regarding food insecurity for the youth by providing these daily meals. And while that continues for the short term, we're actually now setting up an aquaponics and agriculture community learning center so that families can learn new techniques to maximize crop yields and no longer be hungry. So we believe that the combination of these opportunities opens doors so that our youth can identify their individual root causes of poverty and overcome them. When they overcome their individual poverty, they lift their family and their communities out of poverty with them. So we really believe that the combination of this opens the doors so that the youth can be empowered leaders inspired to end the systemic poverty in their, in their country. So again here, I kind of want to take a little pause moment because I really think it's important when you're developing a solution, when you're developing a social enterprise or a program, you have to take the time to ask, can I introduce harm in the process of trying to do good? You know, we always wanna focus on our positive outcomes of our work, right? Oh, this is gonna be so great. This is gonna make such a big change or this is gonna work. And it's really important to assess what could be some of the negative byproducts. Can they be avoided? And if they can't be avoided, do the positives outweigh the negatives? So next, how does my solution create systemic and sustainable change? We believe that our model creates systemic change because we're empowering a generation of leaders. They're the ones who are gonna break the cycle of poverty, first individually and at a family level, then a community level. And they're also being empowered to advocate and lead the broader change at the national level. And we're working hard to ensure that this model is sustainable by exploring income generating activities and building an alumni program that encourages those who've, who've grown up through the program to come full circle and then open doors for the next generation. So why do I wanna be a part of the solution? This last question is one of the most critical because our intentions and our motivations for our work can dictate whether they will be sustainable. As leaders, we need to understand our why to ensure that we're doing the what for the right reasons and in a way that will tackle poverty systemically, and in a way that creates lasting change and impact. So with that being said, you know, again, I'm so excited um, to be a part of this. I cannot wait to hear what your motivations are for being a change maker in this world. And I know I'm gonna be seeing some incredible social enterprises aimed at sus sustainably alleviating systemic poverty. So thank you again so much, and on to the next one.